Hello and welcome to this episode of Bush Footy Legends. Before we begin, we would like to acknowledge that this podcast is being recorded on the traditional lands of the Noongar people and pay respect to their elders past, present and emerging. The show is produced by Magic Studios and presented by the WA Country Football League in partnership with Healthway, promoting the Think Mental Health message. On today's show, a Claremont legend and a Carlton Premiership player who has the ultimate country football story. From the wheat belt town of Cooker in one season, he was handpicked off the farm by David Parkin to Princess Park and an MCG grand final the next. Now he's doing even more important work back home in WA as the chairman of regional men's mental health. I'm your host, Jackson Barrett. Let's get into it. Ross Ditchburn, thank you very much for joining us on the podcast. How's things? Where do we find you today? Well, Jackson, i am um, just uh, finished a couple of hours in the garden and... Um, yeah, just polished myself up a little bit to do this podcast. But uh, we're in Bunbury now. We've uh, we retired from the farm, signed the farm over to my son, Nathan, back on the 30th of June and uh, enjoying retirement. Do you still get to spend a bit of time down in Cookeran or are you settling into Bunbury life now? Uh, settling into Bunbury life. I uh, went back for uh, seeding and I'll go back for harvest and I'll go back for the ram sale. I'll go back for a golf carnival or a bowls carnival. But um, we've got used to the house on the farm, Jackson, for five years or so, just so I can wean myself off and go back whenever I need to. So um, it's a good setup. We've got a good plan and um, it should all work out fine. Haven't quite been able to put yourself away completely by the sounds of it. Um, We'll get on to some of your uh, incredible footy stories and and all you achieved in that space shortly. But tell us about uh, growing up in the wheat belt and what that was like growing up on the farm and all that comes with it. Well, I think I'm very fortunate that um, I was, you know, I was given, well, in the position to be brought up on a farm because it is a great way for kids to uh, learn about life and life and death and that when you've got livestock and, and you're growing plants and, and you have, um, you know, different seasonal outcomes that determine how good of a year you're going to have and all that sort of thing. So, and being part of a small community like Cookran is, um, it's a great grounding. You're always dealing with adults. You learn to respect people. And, um, yeah, it's just a great, great um, grounding for life ahead. What sort of freedom and independence does farm life bring? I've heard stories of you playing around with rifles as a youngster and, and doing all those sort of things. Do you feel like those sort of experiences sort of shaped you a little bit? Yeah, well, they, uh, they teach, you, teach you lessons uh, along the way because I do remember, I do remember going out roo shooting once and, and having the 22 laying across my, my lap. And uh, I was driving and I uh, thought, geez, did I pull the safety on on that or not? And anyway, I just thought I'd just check the trigger just to make sure the safety was on, but it wasn't. And the bullet went through the door of the ute. And uh, we spent uh, we spent a couple of hours with chewing gum trying to patch it up so we didn't see it. And I'm, I'm glad Dad's not here now to listen to this podcast because he probably would have thought that was a bit silly, but... Things like that happen, and we used to have a lot of fun out in the out in the paddocks, uh, jumping on and off the combine, or dragging behind the scarifier, and just just having fun really. And and we did we used to go um, shooting uh, foxes and that sort of thing when we were very young at a very young age, and we could drive all the vehicles, and and we even sort of drove tractors and and stuff for um, dad and his brother when they wanted to knock off for lunch. Or when they needed to be something to be taken back to the shed or whatever, it was yeah, it was good good part of my life. Did the car door bullet hole ever come to be found? Not not by dad, I don't reckon. It um, like because my sister was in the uh, Ute with me and my brother was on the back, so we they all knew about it. But I don't reckon dad ever found out about that one. Did well to cover that up. What was school life like uh, in the country um what are your sort of earliest footy memories did they come from school or in town and how did that work uh well a lot of a lot of my early school memories do involve um recess morning recess and lunchtime and and full-on uh end-to-end man-on-man sort of stuff and that 
that sort of, um, you know, it taught you how to how to get the ball because back in those days there was 100 kids in the school. There's probably uh, 20, 20 to 25 kids in each class. So you get the senior senior boys out there, and it's a it's a pretty good learning learning uh, process when you when you you know kicking from end to end, and you're practicing your marking, and you you after the ball when it hits the ground, and all that sort of stuff. And it's something that young kids probably don't get now within the uh, school system back home because the, the numbers are well down, and sometimes there's only three or four boys in year five, six, and seven. So it's certainly a lot harder for them than it was for us, but we used to play against the neighbouring towns, Lake Grace and Dumble Young. Um, not, not lots and lots of games, and there was no D-grade structure uh, that sort of was under the Cook and Football Club. But we got enough. We got enough um, football to get a grounding, and and then once you, once you're old enough, you get to play B-grade at a very young age. I think I played with Dad when I was 12. And uh, that was towards the end of his career, but there were a lot of other father and sons doing the same thing in the B grade. So, yeah, it was just, it was good, good fun. Do you reckon it's something that might be lacking these days or that you sort of benefited from in the day, the very like schoolyard footy instincts and hunting the ball and learning how to be man on man and those sort of things that you touch on? Do you think it's something that they don't get quite as much these days? Well, they certainly don't. And like a lot of the teachers are very, very careful now that, um, you know, all, all activity is monitored and, and supervised because if anyone gets hurt at school now, you, you've got the problem of litigation and that, which is a shame really, because um, it's a great part of your school life is that, that interaction with the other kids at recess and lunchtime. And it doesn't matter whether it was football or cricket, it was full on. It was full on. And we didn't need supervising. It was just we supervised ourselves because there was um, – and, and it was all about everyone getting a go. And I know these days it's about participation as well. But back then you had to um, – if you're out, you're out. You weren't, you, you weren't going to stay in there for 10 overs or five overs or anything like that. So you had to improve your technique or your, your hand-eye coordination to make sure that you got a fair go. No third umpire at Cookran Primary School. <laughs> um, what was playing with your dad like? I mean, and senior footy at such a young age is is one of those things that we always talk about in the country that you don't get elsewhere. But playing with, even if it was just a handful of games, with your dad would have been a special footy experience. Yeah, it was a special footy experience, and I and I and I remember kicking the ball with dad at home as well. So. And my uncle Bob, Bob Ditchburn, who was on the farm at the same time, he, he probably actually kicked the ball a little bit more with me because he was a bit younger and he didn't have boys. He had four girls, so um, he enjoyed uh, just that little bit of um, little bit of you know father father nephew sort of set up. So it was good. And what about um, as you sort of came through the ranks in senior footy, Cooker and Footy Club became and you sort of come back to it a little bit later on in your time, but became quite a central part of your life by the sounds of things. How did you sort of move through the grades there? Did a senior's debut or a um, first grade debut come pretty quickly? Or uh, Well, obviously when you when you finish year seven at Cooker and you head away to high school, so I went to Aquinas College in 1970, uh, 1970. And spent five years down there. And obviously, when we went back for um, school holidays and long weekends, we we played uh, mainly mainly B grade to um, just help help the numbers out in the B grade. And um, it wasn't probably till year ten um, that we they started to give us a, an odd game of league footy. But they had plenty of players back in those days as well. So it was not. Um, not a common common thing for the kids to play A grade, but I do remember in 1974 we played Newdigate in a grand final at uh, Tin Curran or Do I think it was, and um, there was a couple of kids away at school, myself and Colin Mott, and they um, they in their wisdom they decided to pick us in front of a couple of guys that had played all year. Uh, Newdigate hadn't been beaten all year, and we uh, thrashed them in the grand final. I remember kicking eight goals and winning a bottle of cold duck, which I took back to Aquinas and shared with the boys that night. Um, 
it's uh, that was a really pretty good experience, and that was probably my first exposure to Claremont. Um, and that's really what um, probably made them chase me a little bit harder. They had been fostering a relationship while I was at, at Aquinas and taking me to the Claremont Games and and looking after. There was a couple of us, so they used to take us out for lunch and and take us to the games and then drop us back at school. And it was a yeah, it was good times. Did it cause a stir in town? The young fellas from boarding school being parachuted in for a grand final. Um, yes, it did. Yes, it did. Luckily, there were a couple of injuries as well, and um, you know it made it made it a little bit easier. But there were there were a couple of guys that missed out, and and it's you know it's hard hard in any at any level of footy to go through that if you played the whole year. So yeah, it was. Um, it was different, but we obviously we were young and keen and and um, weren't thinking about those sort of things back in the, those days, and we're just happy to play. We obviously know you as the um, goal kicking key forward, but what sort of a role did you play growing up? Uh, through through most of my um, college years at Aquinas, I played at centre half back, and uh, really enjoyed playing in that position. I found. You know, found if you could read the ball, you could mark and you could kick. It's um, it was a pretty rewarding, um, pretty re- rewarding position to to play in. And I've just lost you there for a minute, Jackson, but you're back. Yeah, um, got us back now. I think the low battery sign came on, but <laughs> um, it was a, it was a good position to play in, and um, yeah, and I, I didn't progress to the forward line until I went to Claremont when they. Sort of grew me as a centre half forward. I played an odd, odd game at full forward when Warren Ralph or Norm Uncle or one of those guys wasn't playing, but um, generally I was all centre half forward. So you, at the time, it's a South Fremantle zone now, but at the time you were in the Claremont zone, and then they sort of put the work in a little bit while you're at Aquinas, and obviously kept a close eye on you. But do you remember the sort of early days of being included in that Claremont group and and being around the the senior boys? Yeah, it was um, it was a pretty good transition actually because there was a lot of country boys there at the same time as I was, um, and all training hard, trying to trying to um, forge careers down the track. And it was um, pretty early when we got that opportunity because I, I remember playing three Colts games um, under Sid Dewfold, I think it was at that in, in those days, and then played three reserves games. And then made my uh, league debut at the age of 18 after um, six games um, in that 80, uh, 75 season. And I think there were seven of us that made our debut on the same day. So Mel Brown was looking to build the base of um, something that was going to be successful down the track. And it did. It was successful down the track. So obviously a, a key part of the early days for that Claremont group. 14 games and 18 goals in your first season. And I know the second season was, I think it was nine games as well. So was it a bit of an interrupted start? Was that um, sort of injuries and coming through as a youngster or was it some time in the twos? What were the first couple of years like under Brown? Um, there was a bit up and down. Obviously, um, it was going to be a a big call to leave those seven players all in the side at, at the one time. And I think Brownie just, um, he made a point of giving us a taste and then putting us back in the twos and then um, giving you another opportunity down the track. So I think it was a pretty clever strategy on his behalf to uh, to blood some new players and um, and make sure that, you know, if we deserved to stay there, we, we stayed there. And if we didn't, we learnt and had to work hard to get back in the side. So... I think it, it paid dividends for all of us because we all became regular players and there was guys like Kevin Worthington, Kim Malcolm, Brenton Hartfield, Daryl Ball, Daryl Bell, I mean. Um, um, and uh, like we've, those, those guys are still friends today and, and you know, we've been given our opportunity together and we've stayed thick right through. So then from there you get 46 goals in 78 and 51 goals in 79 so you're obviously settled into that role a little bit do you feel like you sort of filled out as a 
as a young man and grew into that forward role, they always talk about, you know, key forwards and particularly the young ones ta- and the, the taller guys take a little bit more time. Was that, were they sort of the couple of years where you started to really get settled into your role and into your footy? Yeah, that's right, Jackson. And like when you listen to those figures, it's it's pretty hard for a full forward to kick those goals these days and playing predominantly at centre-half forward, um, it doesn't sound too bad. So... <laughs> I think yeah, I did get the I did get to uh, learn how to play the position. Obviously, having played centre half back and chased centre half forwards around in the past, you get to know where the, to run and that sort of thing. So it's, that was a good grounding for playing in the forward line um, and being able to put pressure on the the backman as well. But yeah, I felt comfortable. Um, certainly after uh, two years at Claremont, I felt comfortable in the fact that I was um, playing centre-half forward. I was probably more of a mobile for, for, uh, centre-half forward than a stand and contest centre-half forward and because I probably wasn't physically strong enough through the chest and that to hold hold uh, opposition players down. So, yeah, it was a good learning experience, that's for sure. What was the calibre of Backman like in those days? You mentioned there sort of being a younger fella and um, being a little bit more mobile. Did you have to sort of get out on the lead and, and beat them for a bit of pace and, and use the skills you learnt down back to sort of read the footy a bit better? I imagine there would have been some um, pretty big and, and willing fellas getting around Waffle senior back lines at the time. Yeah, there was. You, you sort of, I mentioned Doug Green, who was a country boy himself, played centre-half back for East Fremantle, Joe McKay at South Fremantle, Peter Stewart at West Perth, um, Ken Inman and a couple of others from Perth. Now it was just it was an awesome, awesome. Um, every every week you come up against a great player, and I do remember that you know when the ball was kicked high in the air, it was a lot harder to get it than it was if uh, if I was leading and and trying to create a bit of space. And when you got players of the caliber of Jim and Phil Cracker and those so those sort of guys, Kenny Hunter coming off a half back flank. Um, they delivered the ball so well and um it just made made my job a little bit easier in that respect. Did you sort of take a bit of um enjoyment out of that one on one battle and, and the knowledge that you're going out there probably more so than you are today with team defence and the like, you're going out there to to beat your man and there's a bloke in the sitting in the opposition rooms knowing that he's coming out and you're his job for the day. Was there um, sort and sort of like purity in that from a football sense? Yeah, there was. And Ross Glendinning was another one that I'd forgotten about. <laughs> he, he was a nice man. But, uh, but I did also, when when we were young kids, myself and my brother John used to kick the ball on the hay shed roof and then we contest contest the ball as it came off the roof. And those sort of those sort of experiences and that sort of um, you know learning certainly helped uh, me later in life and and when when you um, when you're out there competing against the best center half uh, backs in the in the game it's um, you've really really got to be on your game to be an influence in the um, you know in the game itself so um, it was a great experience I played on some really really great players and um, I yeah I think obviously kicking those sort of numbers from centre half forward was um, I, th- I think I was playing my role in the team. You mentioned Mal Brown before. He's obviously a, a massive figure in in WA footy and particularly as a coach. What was he like, and what sort of relationship did you have with him coming through at the Tigers as a youngster? Um, I, had, I had a pretty good relationship with Brownie, and he loved country guys because they were, you know, they were probably a little bit more grounded, a little bit more balanced in in their life. Um, certainly liked a good time, and um, and so did Brownie. So it was uh, it was a real experience. So Brownie was a different sort of a coach. He was more of a, a fear. You get the best out of your players by putting the fear of God into them, and whether it was pulling your hair or giving you a clip under the ear or whatever. It was a... Um, it was just the way that he did things. And I remember him saying to me, because I played cricket a bit uh, as well when I first left school. I went to Fremantle and played A-grade cricket for Frio. And I remember one day Brownie said to me, he said, well, you've got to make up your mind whether you're playing cricket or football. 
So I had to give cricket away because I really, really wanted to play footy. There were still guys floating around at that time, though, playing even the odd game of shield cricket and certainly A-grade cricket. Did you really have to give it away or was that something, was that a brownie thing more than sort of convention at the time? It was probably a brownie thing at that stage, yeah. I mean, I missed, I was sort of torn between two loves during pre-season training when we're finishing off the cricket season and everyone else is doing the hard yards on the track. Um, Yeah, it made it a little bit difficult. So, uh, but I do remember bowling against Derek Chadwick and Ken McCauley and those sort of players. And and Kim Hughes was playing a bit of um, uh, footy at Claremont as well back in those days. But uh, there were people doing it. I know that. But um, I think I made the right choice. I went on and played cricket a little bit later in life and had a lot of good experiences doing that anyway. So half a dozen years at Claremont and in 81 you head back to Cooker and you take on a, a captain coach role. What, uh, after half a dozen years and, and some good times at Claremont, was the, the idea behind heading back south? Um, well, my brother wanted to have a crack of waffle um, and that's basically the reason I went home was so that he could leave the farm and yeah. and go and have a crack. I'd had six years. I had um, three years. The last three years I played at Claremont, I travelled. I uh, went down on a Friday night, went back home on a Sunday and I think I played my best footy while I was doing that. Maybe not during seeding itself, but outside of the seeding period, I was actually really enjoying, I was able to train a little bit harder and work a bit harder um, because the local footy team in town were more inclined to have a bit of kick kick and um, head to the pub. So <laughs> um, once, once um, seating finished, I was able to train a little bit harder and and I travelled with a guy called Alan Orr who was a very good player for Claremont back then as well and we travelled together and my first wife then was playing A-grade hockey for South Perth, so everything was pretty honky-dory. And, um, yeah, it was, it was just what I could take back to Cookman was um, a lot of a lot about fitness and knowing when you're fit and how to get fit and all that sort of thing. It was hard to instill that into country guys, and I didn't expect them to um, do what we had to do, but... Um, that was basically uh, the pre-seasons were a little bit harder, you know, d- during that time. And I only had the one year there, of course, and we made the grand final in 1981. And um, we went down to Lake Grace. We were beaten by Lake Grace when we probably shouldn't have been beaten by Lake Grace, but we took a few injuries into the game and weren't quite up to scratch. And then I had to sit back and watch Claremont win the 1981 grand final. So... Whether it was the fact that I left and um, freed up freed up someone to play in my place that caused the uh, the win, but they were building building to that win over over many years, and they uh, obviously fulfilled um, a long term rebuilding program. I was going to say, how how does that sort of sit with you looking back that eighty one Claremont Premiership? It was a twenty five year drought, and the sort of nucleus of the guys that you'd come through with. Um, were a, a big part of it. Did you sort of get involved? Did you go to the game? How did you sort of take it all in? Yeah, I went went to the game and um, certainly had a couple of beers with the boys after they'd won, but um, I was just so happy for them, so so glad that uh, Claremont had eventually um, won, a, won a premiership after a long time in the wilderness. But, um, you know, I had uh, obviously... Uh, at, at that stage, Parkin had already been over and um, had a chat to me, so I knew that I was probably I was a chance to go somewhere else the following year. And my brother John, when he went down and and did a pre-season with Claremont, he he did his cartilage and um, ended up having to have a year off. So he came back to the farm, and and that's when um, that's when the Carlton boys came over and recruited me to Melbourne. To Carlton. That one year back in the country, it's almost an extinct thing now. The sort of the captain coach, the on field coach sort of thing. I know Kalani just won a, a premiership with one, but what was that like? And how do you sort of maintain that coach to player and teammate relationship at the same time? Did you put a bit of work into finding that balance or did you come back and there was obviously an element of respect for you having spent that time in the waffle system? 
Yeah, there's obviously a, a, an element of respect there, and the fact that you know I played all my all my junior footy at Cooker in any way, whether it was at the school or having the odd game against the uh, schools around the around the area. Um, yeah, there wasn't any uh, there wasn't any major drama there, and they're all local. Every player we had back then was all local. They're either farmers or or shearers or working in the area. So everyone knew one another and it was just a matter of um, gaining their respect and leading by example, really. And, and if you lead by example, they, they tend to jump on board and follow. So it's handy. it was handy to have that sort of, um, you know, asset to be able to fall back on, that's for sure. So by that time, uh, your ex Claremont teammate Ken Hunter is over at Carlton. Uh, and then the the blues come knocking. Is that is it your understanding that it was they heard about you partly through him? Uh, wholly through Ken. Yeah. And um, yeah, I was just amazed that they were going to come and talk to me. I know what I knew what a great player Kenny was, and how he fitted into that side in 1981 was just amazing. Because they like it was a star-studded lineup and. They uh, they were all God really to us. So um, it was a yeah. It was just I just thought I wasn't quite in that in that league. But when David Parkin and Shano Sullivan flew to Perth, got in about midnight, drove to headed towards Cooker, and they uh, they came to, got to Wagen, and there was a train across the uh, across the road shunting shunting across the road and. They didn't know how long the hell the train would be there, but they thought, oh, well, we'll just park up and have a bit of a snooze. So they did that and they got awoken by somebody behind them took the horn, wondering what the hell they were doing, stopped at the railway crossing and there was nothing there. They realised the train had gone and and on they went and ended up getting to the farm at about seven in the morning and mum gave them some breakfast or some scones. I can't remember quite what we had, but it was just uh, surreal to have David Parking sit sitting at the uh, kitchen table and having a bit of a discussion with mum and dad and and me and and talking about me going to um, try out for Carlton. So it was amazing, really. What did you know of Parkin at the time and the Blues? Is it, um, you know, the winners and the odd sort of glimpse of VFL or were you someone who followed it intently? What was sort of your knowledge of them at the time? Uh, the the biggest the biggest thing about the uh, VFL in those days was the winners on a Sunday night. It was just one of those shows you hardly ever missed. I remember every every TV and every hotel after footy on a Sunday would have the winners on, and everyone would be glued to the screen watching the highlights and the streamers and the mud and the hits and the biffs and the, everything that was going on, and and like it was just. Yeah, it was just somewhere where I never ever thought I'd be, and uh, to be given the opportunity, and secondly to take the opportunity was um, just something I'm so grateful for. What was the sell like from Carlton? So you're obviously a farm boy. You've spent time in Perth. You've come back. Did it take a fair bit to to get you across? How did they get you over the line? Uh, well, obviously, I had to get the blessing of my brother John because he um, he'd, he'd come back after doing a cartilage, and he obviously uh, realised it was going to be an opportunity of a lifetime. Uh, we were going to be we we're going to be short of labour on the farm without me there and without organising a full time work, workman or a, or somebody to help at seeding time at least. And Carlton said, "Don't worry about that. You find the man, we'll pay him." So right. <laughs> That's um, that's basically how it freed me up to to go away. I stayed. I went over and watched the eighty-one grand final and uh, met all the boys that night, and thought these guys are just like me. No, they're they're just human beings, and they love having a good time. And I thought, well, you know, I'm not going to have any trouble fitting in in um, you know with these guys. So. Well, I was really grateful uh, to be given the opportunity and so glad I took it. And it was a hard decision because we had a one-year-old son at that stage. Uh, going to Melbourne, um, my wife not having any family support, um, it was going to be tricky, but um, we did it. And it was, um, they, Carlton had given me a training program to do 
um, like during harvest and for the immediate period after harvest so that I was not too far behind when I went to Melbourne in January. But uh, when, you, when you're out there alone and you've got to get off the header and, and start jogging fence lines and you're trying to discipline yourself to, to uh, jog five and sprint 10 and, and do them in certain times and get the miles into your legs as well, it, was, um, it wasn't easy. I thought I was going okay until I arrived um, at Carlton in early 1982. What point in pre-season did you, do, did you arrive? Did you sort of arrive in time to do the whole thing with the boys? And what sort of nick were you in when you were there? Did you find that you were a little bit behind? And what was that standard like of fitness and, and aerobic capability and that sort of thing compared to over here? Well, it was way, way, way above anything that I'd ever experienced before. And no, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, I wasn't anywhere near fit enough when I first got there. And I remember training for 14 days in a row without having one night off. And at that stage, we were staying at the Park Royal Motel, which was um, about 100 metres away from the ground. I had to walk out the front door, walk over a couple of roads, not get hit by a tram, fall into, um, fall into a pool when I got home and try and recover before the next training session the following night. So... It was extremely hard. I found it, found it really, really hard. At one stage there, I remember being on the trainer's table with um, checking my heart out because I was having a bit of heart, heart, um, heart pain. And, um, but eventually I got through all that and come out the other side. And I, I remember going to Swan Hill and playing in a uh, scratch match against Richmond and uh, kicking six goals from centre half forward and thinking, geez, I'm half a chance to play the first game of the year. But uh, that wasn't to be. Were you a self motivated person or did it take a little bit of a rocket from Carlton to sort of get you back up speed when you got there? Um, I thought I was self motivated because we did a lot of training at home. Even when I was at Claremont, we did a lot of training at, you know, if we were working at the back paddock, it was seven Ks away. We'd take our joggers and at the end of the day, we'd run home. That's myself and John. So it was, um, I thought I was self-motivated, but to experience what you, what level you had to be at to play VFL football, it was just, that was another experience altogether. But once you've been there, once you've done it once, it is so, so much easier to get back there again and to try and, instill that into the guys when I came back home was um, they don't need to be that fit, obviously, but to tell them the stories about running 2200s uh, on a Monday night at training because we'd lost on a Saturday, uh, every 200 we ran had to be run in a certain time with a certain amount of recovery, and there was a reason why every 200 was run, and that was because a player did something wrong and Parker would identify who the player was this is who we're doing this one for. Um, uh, make sure you don't do it again. And consequently, when he started, when he um, when he enforced that penalty on a Monday night, we lost only two games for the rest of the year. So it's a it's good, uh, yeah, good way to learn how to get get fit and, and play well. Do you remember any of the two hundreds being slapped on you? Every you every time we had to do it, it was either. Yeah, every player was um, isolated and told that this is why they're doing that 200. And I remember one instance when I may have gone for a mark and, and sort of dropped my head a bit and dropped the mark. Uh, Parkins sent the runner out and said, do not ever drop your head again, son. Take what's coming. So <laughs> he was a very inspirational man and and you did exactly what he told you to do because, um, yeah, he was just... He was one of those guys that you hung on every word he said and he was so passionate and you're probably aware of the jugular that used to poke out in his neck when he got really excited and he was just a, he was a great motivator and, and probably one of the greatest men I've ever met. So the league debut comes against Footscray round eight. What are your memories of it? You, you kicked a goal. What sort of an occasion was it for you? Well, that was probably one of two kicks that day, so <laughs> Quite not, not really that memorable. And playing on the Western Oval, which was long and wide and um, and playing at centre-half forward, and playing, I 
can't quite remember who I lined up against, but he was a pretty solid, solid bloke. And and they were kicking the ball long, long to me to a contest, and I just couldn't get near it. It wasn't strong enough, as I said, in the chest to be able to hold my ground and take strong marks. And and uh, obviously after that game against um, uh, Footscray, I was dropped back to the twos again. And I remember going to David Park and then. And just saying to him, I, I think I'm going to struggle at centre half forward, David. Um, do you think you're going to persevere with that, or do you, do you think I'm going to make it? Do you, should I go home or what? So there was a lot of self doubt at that stage. And um, he said, Well, we're struggling at full forward. We haven't got a full forward. We haven't got a permanent one. We'll try you at full forward in the reserves. And um, and that was probably the turning point of my career. What sort of a conversation is that? It's obviously David Park and he's at that time, you know, the best coach in the game and, and all of those things. And to have to sort of go to him as a, a guy who's sort of just rolled into the club and, and put your heart on your sleeve a little bit. What sort of a moment was that like? You, you say it was a turning point, but it would have taken, would have taken some guts to go and sort of say that to him. Well, it's something, something I wouldn't have done if I'd have gone over there when I was 18, Jackson. But the fact yep. that... Uh, Recruited players when they were mature age and ready to play, probably uh, puts you in a better, better, better stead for, to be able to go and have those conversations. Because you know it's a big, big decision to move your family and and uh, leave your farm and, and go to Melbourne, a very strange town with trams and lots of different road rules and and a uh, very, very busy place. So, yeah, to go when you're, I was a bit older certainly helped um, help the transition. It turned pretty quickly, though, didn't it? So seven weeks later, you play against Melbourne and you kick six, and then the next week against St Kilda, you kick 12. Uh, 18 goals in, in two games and your second and third games at, at VFL league level. They would have been um, pretty special days. You don't get in a zone like that as a as a footballer or an athlete very often. Talk us through it. Um, yeah, well, it's a, quite amazing, really, that um, the players uh, adopted me as their full forward very, very quickly. And I started, um, obviously, I was a leading full forward and a lot of the fullbacks that I, I, I was playing on back in those days were getting towards the end of their careers. And they'd been used to, um, you know, the ball coming in long and contested, uh, a lot of contested ball and that sort of thing. And when when I started to lead, they'd sort of hang off me, expecting the ball to be kicked long. And I was able to get a two or three metres on most of my opponents and the boys kicked the ball so well. Um, all the midfield, even off half back with guys like Wayne Harms and, and Bruce Dool and those sort of guys coming off half back and through the centre of the ground and then starting to look for me from there. It, um, it was an amazing transition from self-doubt to full of confidence in the space of um, a, a couple of weeks. And from that point on, like I went on and kicked um, a couple of nine goal hauls and a seven goal haul and, and was a, thought I was playing a pretty important role in the Carlton side leading into the finals that year. But yeah, the 12 goals at St Kilda was something um, pretty, you know, really special. I played on Simon O'Donnell and uh, a fella did an article on me uh, leading up to the St Kilda game this year and he was talking about the 12 goals and he actually uh, got a quote from Simon O'Donnell and Simon told him that I should be, he's, I should be sending him bottles of champagne for Christmas every year because... <laughs> Because uh, I made he made me as a footballer, and I said, "Well, I made him as a cricketer because he retired <laughs> from football and became one of the best one day cricketers." <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think there's a bit of both ways happening there. Did he go easy on you that day, Simon? No, I don't think so. He was Simon was um, he was a big boy even back then. Probably lacked a little bit of pace. And we were able to expose that by the way the boys fed the ball to me. So, um, yeah, it was a it was a memorable day. I didn't know who Simon O'Donnell was then, but I'm very very glad that I got the opportunity to shake his hand and and um, see him progress into one of the greatest cricketers Australia have had, one day cricketers. 
Did it take a bit of a change up the ground? You obviously listed a couple of those fairly incredible ball users, Harms and Dool up the ground. But for your, you to be instilled as, as key forward, but more of a, a lead up, take it on your chest sort of key forward and, and win some space for yourself. Did that take a bit of a change up the ground? Uh, yeah, I think so. There was, um, you know, some of the midfielders weren't um, used to doing that sort of thing. And I know like guys like Rod Ashman and Ken Sheldon and Alex Marku and um, guys like that were, you know, they were they were on the lookout for me all the time. Uh, Wayne Johnson, he's, he had a mate, Peter Bazasto, that he kicked the ball to most of the time. So, <laughs> But it works pretty well. I mean, you can't just focus on one one leading forward all the time because they um, they'll eventually get used to that. And we were lucky that we had other other alternatives. We had Mike Fitzpatrick resting in the goal square and and Buzz on a half forward flank or forward pocket. So there was there was numerous options, but obviously there was more room in the corridor back in those days than there is now because that's all closed down, and the full forwards are going to lead to the boundary line. So I was fortunate to be uh, to play in that era and fortunate to play with such a great mob of guys. Do you have a couple of, I know you've listed a few there, but do you have favourites to play with? I mean, Mike Fitzpatrick was um, so clever as a ruckman and uh, obviously Bruce Dool off halfback and Bazusto in the forward line with you. Do you have a couple of favourites? Well, I think the, the, the toughest guy I ever played on was Bruce Dool. I, I know he's in the same team, but... We used to have serious man-on-man training every Tuesday night that yep. used to go two or three hours. And I can remember going to park on one night saying, I played on Bruce last Tuesday. Can I can I play on Southby this week? <laughs> Which isn't much easier. I know. <laughs> and Jeff Southby is just a bonzer fella. And Val Perovic, Val Perovic and I are very, very close. We, um, we touch base at least once every second, second week. Wayne Harms, Rod Ashman, and sadly, Rod lost his wife um, a couple of months ago, and that was a really, really sad day. So I'm looking forward to getting Rod over and um, looking after him for a couple of weeks, get him down to Bunbury, and we'll do a bit of fishing and play a bit of golf and and just uh, get him out of the, um, you know, the run-of-the-mill um, Victorian um, way of life that he's in at the moment. It's He's got his kids to back him up, and all the players are backing him up, so... He's in a good space, but they looked after us when we first went to Melbourne. So I'm looking forward to returning the favour for him in the near future. Um, Wayne Harms was always a very close friend of mine and spent a lot of lot of time together. Kenny Hunter, obviously, uh, but just every player, just you know, you know, superstars really, and and great great guys, really really close on and off the ground, and that that was the difference in that in that era when they won 79, 81, 82, they were such a close group of fellas. David Parkin didn't really realise what was happening, you know, off the field with that group of guys, but we certainly, um, we trained hard and we played hard back in those days. We touched before on some of the great waffle fullbacks, but they're only on, only going to get bigger and stronger over there. Other than the blokes you had to battle it out with at training, were there other guys that you enjoyed those sort of duels with in the VFL? Yeah, it was guys like Kelvin Moore and David Dench, uh, Barry Breen. Uh, Barry Breen actually went on to me after Simon O'Donnell got taken off me in <laughs> time. But, you know, guys like that have been icons of the game and, and getting towards the end of their careers. And they, they're obviously slowing down a little bit. So they were probably not the hardest guys I've ever played on. The ones that were hard to play on were the guys that were trying to break into the sides and guys like um, Rod Carter from the Sydney Swans. He used to walk with a bit of a bent uh, head and he just rest his head on, on your shoulder and grab hold of your jumper. And that's as far away as he'd get from you all day. Very, very hard player to play on. Remember playing on Gary Malarkey and and Gary Pert and oh, there was just yeah, there was never an easy game. That's for sure. It was just depended on how much midfield ascendancy you had as to how easy the player was to play on. Was there a bit more happening off the ball than there might be today as well? 
little bit, a little bit, <laughs> quite a bit, <laughs> quite a bit. Um, you can see my see my fingers; they're very, very bent, and the back of my head. I'm sure it doesn't look like a football, but it got punched plenty of times. <laughs> so it was uh, it was a great era to play footy in. Um, once you cross that white line, it was on for young and old. But as soon as the siren sounded, we used to have after matches with the uh, with the opposition sides, and and that was a great it was a great way to catch up with ex West Australians that were playing for other other clubs. But it was also an opportunity to forge relationships with the players that you played on, and and the respect that everyone had for each other was um, yeah, it was really good. Now, thirteen goals in the three finals ahead of that. 82 grand final and of course you you play Richmond um it's the grand final probably best known I think it might be fair to say for Helen D'Amico yeah you're probably <laughs> there I mean she's got more exposure out of that game than anyone that had played in the game I think but um yeah it was a bit I was um obviously concussed at the 20 minute mark of the uh, first quarter and I did spend the first half in the well, the, the rest of the first quarter and the second quarter in the change rooms being um, monitored. Yeah. Um, and then they let me out onto the bench at half time, and, and the streaker never appeared till after half time. So I didn't miss that. I didn't miss getting up and getting my medal. But um, as far as the rest of the game goes, other than watching the replay and seeing how it all unfolded, the rest of the, the game on that particular day was a bit of a blur. After I'd got my medal and did the lap of honour, I collapsed in the change rooms, was put in an ambulance and uh, taken to hospital. And they didn't let me out till two o'clock in the morning. So as you can imagine, I didn't get to celebrate on the night with the boys, but um, I was so, so fortunate to be a part of the grand final day, to be a part of the build up, the parade, the training during the week. And the excitement of um, getting ready for a grand final and running out onto the MCG uh, was pretty special. We know what it's like these days, but what what was a grand final week like in in Melbourne in the day? The parade and everything surrounding it, was it just as big as it is now? Yeah, it was just as big as it is now. And and there'd be 10,000 people at training and everyone's wanting your autograph afterwards. And so you spend quite a bit, bit of time in the car park after training before you actually got to head home. But, um, yeah, it was just a, a very surreal week, really, the, the whole build-up and and the parade was just amazing. Uh, I remember sitting in one of the cars and driving down Swanston Street and the crowd and everything was just uh, an unbelievable experience. Were you the sort of player and the sort of person that sort of lapped that up at the time? Was that sort of the attitude you went over there with or was it daunting or...? No, I thought it was very daunting, actually. It was um, like it was nice to be a part of it, but she's a, it was a fanfare and a half, that's for sure. It was something that you wouldn't experience in WA anywhere. So, yeah, just lucky to be a part of all that sort of stuff and um, so grateful I got the opportunity. Now, am I right in saying that you were taken out of hospital at 2am and went straight to the Carlton Footy Club that night? That is correct. And um, there was a lot of Swahili being spoken at that hour of the morning. And I thought, no, well, I can't, I'm not going to fit in here. That's for sure. So I yeah. wasn't allowed to drink. So I went home and went to bed and got up about eight, eight or nine o'clock the next morning and sort of headed into the club at about lunchtime. And because most of the guys hadn't been to bed at that stage and and it was pretty pretty tough to uh, to try and uh, catch up and fit in with them, but I eventually did it. So um, yeah, and then for the probably for the next week, it was um, yeah, there was always something happening. There were functions on and um, all that sort of thing. And then uh, then the following week, we went to Brisbane and played in an exhibition game prior to the Commonwealth Games, and then had two or three days on the Gold Coast to uh, relax and play golf and enjoy each other's company after that game. We what lost it. What was the conditioning it. like for the Commonwealth Games exhibition? It's not the uh, most professional build-up. Care factor, zero. Yeah. <laughs> on, on our behalf, Parco's behalf, it meant the world to him because he hates losing any game. Yeah. And Richmond actually beat us in that exhibition game. But, 
we eventually convinced him that it meant nothing and that um, the big game was last week, David, so get over it. So 1983, the following year, um, your best game was a, a five-goal haul in round seven. You played 15 games. Um, it ended up being your last year at Carlton. Can you talk to us about the decision to come home after that year? Yeah, well, my dad was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease and he was really struggling with work on the farm. Um, so, and because because my wife was not 100% settled, I thought it was, you know, it's probably the right move to head back to WA. Um, 1983 was in complete contrast to 1982. I think we had one wet game for the whole year in 1982 and just about every game in 1983 was a blizzard or rain or mud or whatever so it was a complete contrast for a leading full forward hence um i think it was only something like 45 goals for the year and i'd kicked 61 from 13 the year before but um it's um yeah it was a different different ball game altogether and and the players, like the players were sort of um, probably had just lost that hunger a little bit. We, I remember we played in the elimination final against Essendon and, and were beaten uh, the previous year. That wouldn't have happened. But, um, and it's understandable, I guess, that, that you know, three grand finals in, in four years is um, you can rest on your laurels a little bit. What was was it a tough decision to come home, or did you sort of feel as soon as this all happened with your dad that it was what needed to be done? Uh, it needed to be done, but it was a tough decision. Um, but as I said, like the whole scenario was just easier if I went home. So I would thank thank the club, and um, I still love them to death, and would not miss a reunion. And we've already had two of them this year, so. They flew us over for the Richmond game uh, because we beat them in 1982. I mean, in yeah, 1982, they flew us over for a 40-year get-together. And then just a couple of weeks ago, we went back and had another reunion with the 72 Premiers, the 81 and 82 sides all together at Marvel Stadium in a big function room. And it was just one of the most unbelievable events that you'd want to, want to be involved in. And uh, the whole, all of the Premiership players just about all of them are still alive. All the 82 side are, all the 81 side are. There might be a couple of the 72s that have gone, but it was just great to rub shoulders with the, the 72 guys and get up on the stage and sing the song and hang on to the cups and and just, um, yeah, give a bit back to the supporters that have been so faithful to Carlton over a long period of time. It must be one of the more special things about winning a premiership, sort of being um, so tightly linked to the club in such a special way from there? That's obviously, it sounds as if that's something that you really value. Yeah, it is. It is. I've, I've had a couple of live memberships in my time uh, at Cookman, of course, by doing lots and lots and lots of work for the sporting club. But to, to be a life member of the Carlton Football Club after running down the race and spending 20 minutes on the MCG, MCG is a bit, a bit surreal, but it's uh, something that I cherish. Uh, obviously, any player that plays in the premiership side for Carlton is a lot automatic life member. And um, I, I can get a seat at the footy um, any time I like, which is really, really good. And the Carlton Footy Club look after us so, so well. There's Shane O'Sullivan, who was our player manager when I went over there in 82, is now in charge of looking after the past players. And he does a sensational job and... Every time Carlton come to Perth, we all get together and he gets his tickets and looks after us. And, um, yeah, it's just a great club to be a part of and and thankful, you know, that I made the decision to go there. What was your involvement in footy like once you did come home? Uh, well, I obviously uh, took on coaching Cookran again when I came back and coached for another four years. Uh, I got involved in coaching association footy, so I coached Central Great Southern until we moved to Upper Great Southern, and then I coached Upper Great Southern as well. I coached the state countryside for a couple of years, played in the state countryside against um, lots of ex-VFL players that I played against in Melbourne, 
we're all playing for Country Victoria um, or Country New South Wales or Country South Australia. So got to uh, touch base with a few guys again through uh, through my involvement with that. I then went on and uh, became a committee man of, of the WACFL and enjoyed my time uh, putting a bit back into that as well. So haven't never really stopped when I came home. Uh, really enjoyed giving a bit back to Cookran and to Cookran Dumbleyung when we uh, when we merged with Dumbleyung, and um, certainly got no regrets with anything I did. I, I played, I still played a couple of reserves games in in my forties and and um, had a couple of hamstring injuries then, so thought better give it away. But um, the club club was good to me, and hopefully I gave plenty back to them. You spoke a little bit about how strong the numbers were as a younger player. What's it like going through a merger as a footy club where they're so central to the town? What sort of an experience was that to be a part of? Um, Not so bad. Not so bad for the playing uh, group. But when you're trying to get the older members of your community to agree that it's a good idea, it's a little little bit harder. Um, We did have a few hiccups along the way with... um, you know, with the advice we were getting from some of the older players. But uh, in the end, the, the correct decision was made for the future of not only the Cookland Football Club, but for Dumbleyung as well. And uh, from that point on, it's been a try and attract as many uh, many towns and as many people as you can to the club. And and that, that way they've remained very, very successful over the years. Uh, it's been a while since they've won a premiership, but um, they'll get back there. They're very close. They were very close this year. Played in the finals, but bowed out in the first semi. But um, yeah, it's it's um, it's an integral part of your community. And the longer, even though we've got to pay a few players now to to keep the side competitive, it's um, it's an integral part of our town. We need the footy club. Well, we need sporting clubs to to have an outlet from farming on the weekends and and to go and be able to talk to our mates and all that sort of thing. Ross, 2007, you were diagnosed with prostate cancer. Can you tell us a little bit about what that battle was like for you? Yeah, well, when I turned 50, uh, the the um, the state uh, the WA government sent a letter out saying you've got a free uh, health check, go and get it done. When did that? Did my blood blood tests and all the other tests that I could do uh, as part of that um, checkup process? Um, they found a problem with my prostate, and um, it wasn't until two thousand and nine that they actually diagnosed me with cancer because. My PSA level was a little bit high when I was fifty, but when I turned fifty two, it had gone through the roof. Um, I had a rectal examination and found that there was a big lump in my prostate. Um, a biopsy revealed a very aggressive cancer. And within a month, my prostate was out. And luckily, luckily, I they detected it when they did because may not have been here today to tell the story. Uh, it, was a, um, it was something that I took faced head on and just wanted it, wanted the cancer out of my body so I could then deal with the consequences of that at a later date. But um, they they were doing what they were calling nerve sparing operations to try and protect your erectile function back then. And I just said to the surgeon, don't take any risks. If I lose it, I lose it. Uh, we'll deal with that down the track. And, and I have since spoken to some guys that have... Um, you know, didn't have a problem with their erectile function, but their cancers come back. So it was a difficult time in my life. No one likes to hear the word cancer, but um, if you're positive and detected early, um, prostate cancer is one of those ones that we shouldn't die of these days. If you're having your PSA tests and and keeping an eye on it, you shouldn't die from prostate cancer. Um, but, yeah, we, we had to deal with the issue of um, erectile dysfunction. And we tried lots and lots of different things. We tried all the different colored tablets you could imagine. Um, we tried penile pumps and and uh, self-injection. 
But in the end, we discovered what they call an implant, a penile implant, and now I can just pump it up and let it down whenever I like, and it's just the most it's the br- most brilliant piece of apparatus you'd ever want to imagine. Uh, you later became chairman of Regional Men's Mental Health. How did your own experience sort of shape that and, and move you towards that role? Well, when I uh, during my prostate experience, I... Um, uh, run into a group of guys from Manjumup who were running a relay for raising awareness for prostate uh, cancer and raising money for the Prostate Foundation to uh, do research into prostate cancer. I ended up, I didn't run with them. Um, I actually drove the bus that was um, the support bus for the runners. They'd run in two kilometre stints and they'd be running 50 odd kilometers per day. And they were holding functions at each of the regional towns that they went through to raise money for the uh, Prostate Foundation. And it was through through that experience that I met the guys from Regional Men's Health who actually had the talk to a mate ute following uh, following the bus and and being there for anyone that might need to, to talk to them. So there was a guy called Julian Krieg who um, identified me as a a candidate to be on the committee. So I joined the committee and eventually became chairman. I think it's nearly been 10 years, eight to 10 years anyway. Eventually became chairman. I do quite a bit of public speaking on uh, prostate cancer and and, uh, the consequences of prostate cancer. And um, we've got a great group of guys on the ground running a community education program, um, trying to empower men to take responsibility for their own health and well-being, and making sure that if there's a change in their body, they get something done about it. And they um, they keep getting their bloods tested and their skin tested, and and uh, if anything goes amiss or doesn't feel right, that they get it checked out. Is mental health a real part of that as well? Mental health is, we offer primary care for um, for most of regional WA, well, all of regional WA. We don't profess to be able to cure, um, cure mental health problems, but we do lend an ear to anyone that wants to talk and hopefully we put, put point them in the right direction. It's non-invasive. And people, so many people love talking to our guys because they just, they know, they know and they they understand and they're, um, yeah, they just do it in the right way. They're not sort of forcing people into lifestyle changes. That's that's for the, the specialists to do that. Um, but they are there to talk to and be the, the primary care for um, something down the track. We know that like farming in particular is such a sort of volatile industry. Do you find that that's where issues come about sometimes in that um, blokes feel like they need to keep pushing through and getting work done to provide and then on the mental health side of things as well with seasonal impacts and stuff like that? Is that a real factor in um, the sort of status of men's health, both mental and physical, in the country? Yeah, there's, there's so many reasons to to get a bit stressed when you're in the farming business. Obviously, uh, the the ones that you can't control, we sort of um, put in the situational distress uh, basket. Um, it's just the fact that there's been no rain or the fact that, you know, there's been a frost or any of the prices are low, all those, you've had deaths with sheep through cold weather, all those things you can't do anything about. So we try and um, we try and inform the farmers to just control what they can control and not to stress too much about what they can't. Um, it is a very difficult, uh, it's a very difficult environment for relationships. You know, when things get tough, um, you're isolated. There's also succession planning issues. There's um, dads and sons that don't want to talk about what's going to happen in the future when they should be. Uh, there's so many, so many things um, that we've got to be mindful of when we're dealing with um, people in the country. And and the guys do an absolutely fantastic job covering the whole state and being at um, field days. 
uh, running breakfast if there's um, if there's been a problem, there's been a fire or a frost or whatever. They'll they'll get communities together and talk to them and make sure that um, all the guys are getting off the farm and and talking about it rather than sitting at home and stewing about it. So we've got a great organisation, and uh, I'm so proud to be a part of that as well. Hey, given all that, how important is is local footy to those sort of communities? Uh, it's super important. It's getting harder though, Jackson, to um, for some towns to fill sides, and, and some towns are actually taking whole teams up on buses. So uh, that's how important they uh, they think their footy club is to their town. Um, we think, yeah. Most, most football clubs have got access to a little bit of land in their area, so they're cropping, um, getting some funds together so they can pay some players and, and keep, the, keep the teams competitive or keep them on the park. So it's, yeah, it's so important. They're very, they're very aware of the fact that they need that in the town and it's just about as important as the local hotel, really, because you need a meeting point for... Um, for everyone on a weekend and you also need a meeting point in town to to go and have a relax and and talk to the guys about you know if you want if you've got a problem any sort of a problem on the farm or you need some advice or whatever you go to the pub and have a talk to your mate so it is yeah everything everything around a small community is important and um i just think that uh most communities are, are fighting like hell to to keep um Keep surviving. Hey, now that you're off the farm and and settled in Bunbury and that sort of thing, how do you reflect on it all? How do you look back on um, on your time at Claremont and as a Carlton Premiership player? <clears throat> excuse me, um, and all of those things you've achieved in in footy and in life. Um, I feel pretty fortunate that um, uh, that I'm able to communicate with people through through my time as a as a footballer and and being in, in the focus a bit you learn to be able to deal with people um i was actually head boy of aquinas before all this started so i had a bit of a grounding there as well um you know with the public speaking side of things and and yeah it's, it's just such an important part of uh, your whole life from growing up in the country to uh, to playing footy on the MCG to um, to helping somebody that might ring up with a problem with their prostate because they know that I've had prostate cancer. So I feel, I feel um, privileged to be able to uh, live the life I am now. I'm really looking forward to retirement and doing a little bit more work with regional men's health, being not far away from the Grandies, who the six of them in Perth and two back on the farm. Uh, watching them develop and play sport as well and hoping that they become good community members and um, and uh, put a bit in to their community. Bit of time to watch this young Carlton group in there as well? Yeah, sure, it certainly is. <laughs> Very, uh, I've done a lot better in the tipping competition this year than I have for the last uh, five or six years. So Carlton have uh, won a few games for me, which has been really good. Um but yes, I think they've got they've learned a lot this year. It's a pity they couldn't have got over uh, Melbourne or Collingwood to just have that that finals experience as well. But I think the fact that they were uh, competitive against Melbourne and competitive against Collingwood, more than competitive actually, they just couldn't hang on. Uh, they'll take a lot of confidence into next year. They uh, they obviously would have learned a lot by some of the uh, mistakes they made this year and they'll certainly be a better better um better balanced better prepared side next year than they were this year so looking forward to seeing what they can offer in uh in 2023 ross thank you so much for jumping on our podcast and sharing what is a um not only a fascinating but a, a really important story as well we really appreciate your time and and coming on today and um and sharing those stories with us Thanks, Jackson. Thanks for the opportunity, mate. And uh, keep up the good work um, with the mental health side of it. Thanks, Ross. Cheers. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bush Footy Legends. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you like, follow and share it with your mates. Make sure you check in on them while you're there. 
For tips and advice on how to look after yourself, your family, and your mates, visit thinkmentalhealthwa.com.au. Get in touch with us through our Instagram page at WA Country Football, or if you want to suggest a guest, email us at wafc.com.au. If you're after more, stay tuned. We'll have an episode dropping every week.